Now we come to the last of our series this morning. We could go on a long time yet because we have hardly touched on these glorious I Am's of our Lord Jesus. I will spare myself recapitulating what we've talked about uh, on previous morning. Are there any friends here who are here for the first time? Oh, well, perhaps I better re recapitulate. All right. Well, what if, where have you been all this time? Anyhow, we're very glad you've come. And uh, better late than never. And we can just trust that God's going to give you on this one occasion which you've been able to come all that he intends that you should have. We've been thinking together uh, in a connected series in these, these morning, morning meetings of some of the great I am's of John's Gospel. On seven occasions the Lord Jesus said I am and then there follows a picture word which describes what Jesus is made to be to people as needy and as failing as ourselves. And we've been seeing that Jesus Christ is made to us all we need. Alas, we haven't had time to touch more than two of the I am so far. So far. There was the first message about Jehovah, which means I am. The unfinished sentence, that very name is like a blank check. God says, I am, well what are you Lord? What you need at any given moment. And grace permits us to fill up that check to the full amount of our need all the time. Alas, we don't. We try and think about our own checks and our own wretched bank balance and of course it isn't adequate but there's no limit to grace and to what that bank balance has in store for you and for me and then we've seen that it revealed so much in Jesus in these I am the his the first one we looked at was I am the door and we saw that there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin there's a door that is open and you may go in at Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. We saw that he is the door out of all the darkness and death produced by original sin into the family of God. That's the door by which we have to enter in if we're to, say, to be saved. And that door is Jesus himself. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He's not come to condemn you. He's not come to point a finger at you. He's come to save, to melt you, to bring you to repentance and nothing to peace. <laughs> and we also saw that he's the door for the Christian out of every other darkness and dryness that sin brings into every other blessing that the Bible speaks of that we may have. Everything is through that door. How easy it is to try and get into deeper blessing into the fullness of the Spirit by climbing up some other way that doesn't involve repentance rather than going through the door opened at the foot of the cross. And then we saw yesterday that that door leads us not into a palace or a garden, into a so to speak static experience, but onto a way. And we saw that the Christian life is a walk, something present and continuous, and that if it is a walk, there must be a way provided for us to walk on. We thought of those freeways, we thought of those uh, Pennsylvania turnpikes and other roads. How easily and swiftly do we not get from one place to another, but how impossible would not be the journey but to those highways, but to those freeways. The pioneers must have taken months and months to uh, take a journey which now takes us a few hours and we have a have to need a way and we saw that that way is Jesus and his blood I am the way we saw it was the way of the precious blood it was also the way of repentance and it was the way of life well that was something of the ground we covered I just had it in my mind to add a further word to what we said about Jesus as the way yesterday we walk with him and on him he and his self is our way 
We walk that way, however, with others. And if we are in fellowship with him, we will be in fellowship with others on that highway. If we're not in fellowship with others, if there are barriers between us and others, wrong attitudes of unlove and contempt and despising or resentment and criticism, then we're not in fellowship with Jesus. Our fellowship with himself is no better than our fellowship with our brother. And the things that come between my brother and me also come between him and me. In fact, I remember years ago when our friends from Africa first came back to England to give their simple testimony of what God had taught them in revival, they brought with them a little illustration, which was very helpful, the illustration of the mosquito net. And the mosquito net, you know, comes down not only one side of the bed, but on the other, of course, you folks here don't need to use them. But out in Africa they do, otherwise they get bitten and they get malaria. And so over the bed, you see, you have from the bed, and the mosquito net comes down here, it's tucked in under the mattress here, and tucked in under the mattress there. And just before going to bed, you pull out your flash lamp and you look round inside and see they haven't shut any mosquitoes in. And then you can go to sleep at peace. Well, this is the illustration they brought, that it's possible for something to come between you and your brother. And for that, and that thing not to be what we would call a very big thing, it's only a slight barrier, a mosquito net. You can talk through a mosquito net, you can look through a mosquito net, but it's there. A mosquito net between me and my brother, me and my wife, me and anybody. And I'm just not loving them, I'm just resenting them, I just feel wrong towards them. It's sin. But if it's such a slight thing, it's little more than a mosquito net, it's something underlying only. But the thing is, the mosquito net comes down the other side of the bed too. And the same mosquito net that hangs between me and my brother also hangs between me and the Lord Jesus. And I find I'm not really as close to him as I have been before. I don't know what's wrong. I pray, Lord, I love you. So that's what's wrong. And the mosquito net that has began there comes right over and now it's between you and me. Well, do you know that experience? Sometimes it begins the other way around. Something goes wrong between you and the Lord Jesus. You start worrying about him, complaining to him about something. And then when you meet another Christian, you find you're not to walk towards them. You don't warm up and get into close fellowship with them. There's a mosquito net. But I don't know, I love old friends, and he's a dear brother. I, well, what's gone wrong, Lord? Oh, I started here. And the mosquito net that starts between you and me also comes down the other side. So the two relationships go together. And then these friends of ours, I remember, they said, but we've found that if you don't deal with that and call it sin and go to Jesus for forgiveness and cleansing and repentance, the devil comes along and he turns the mosquito net into a blanket. And there's a blanket between you and your brother and a blanket between you and God and you can't see through a blanket so you can speak some. And it's a bit thicker. And you know it isn't that you've sinned more. It isn't that you've sinned any more. The same thing is not dealt with, if not repented of, thickens. The same silly little thing. But you wouldn't call it, wouldn't deal with a mosquito net, now it's have a blanket. You blanket off from the Lord and blanket it off from your brother. And then if you don't deal with it, then the devil comes along and he turns into a brick wall. And you're bricked off from your brother, you're bricked off from, from the Lord, and you're a little isolated person, the only person in the world who's right. Complete martyr. Oh, you know, I think, I think that old Saul got to that place. It's terrible man who gave David such a bad time. And yet he got so bricked off, he felt he was the martyr. He said, none of you are sorry for me that the son of Jesse has conspired against me. He was the martyr how mad we can be, how irrational. And you know, you can get ripped up at your little wall so full of self-pity. Nobody worries about me, nobody cares about me, no one comes and calls me, no, no, one, no one talks to me. And not even God seems to do anything. And friend, it's you that's wrong. It's you. The past never come. No Christian ever calls. Nobody takes any notes on me. <laughs> it's you. Every time. And nothing separates you from the Lord and from your brothers and sisters in Christ 
so much as sin. Even a mosquito net. And I say again, it doesn't mean that the brick wall represents more sin. It's the same silly little thing. But which I wouldn't deal with at the cross. And now it's become a brick wall. But oh, thank God when you're with me. You look up at last and find that no roof, thank God. You're, oh Lord, I'm wrong. He deals with the lot. <laughs> but with all the lot of the barrier. Well, that's how it is on that highway. And you have to walk with one another. I'm thinking of uh, uh, a friend of mine, a preacher friend, he's a dear friend back in Britain. And um, he wasn't preaching that morning. He was uh, going to attend the service and he was waiting for his wife to get ready. And he was downstairs and he called her and said, Aren't you ready yet? She said, All right, I'm coming. <laughs> and so they went to church. <laughs> it wasn't surprising that they were rather silent. It wasn't surprising that fellowship didn't flow very well on the way to church. And you know what happened? You see, he had slipped off the highway on one side. And she had slipped off the highway on the other side. And Jesus was left alone. But you know, as he went along, as they went along, the Lord Jesus spoke to my friend. And he just repented. He said, oh Lord, it's wrong. So he said, turned to his wife and said, I'm sorry, darling. I shouted at you. He said, well, I'm sorry that I resented you shouting at me. You see, he'd gone off one side. She'd gone off the other. You see, Jesus doesn't shout at people. He's the lamb. And Jesus doesn't resent being shouted at. But he's the lamb. And their necks grew stiff with one another. But worst of all, they slipped away both of them from Jesus. But there was a way, the blood sprinkled way. And he came back to Jesus. And she came back to Jesus. And in coming back to Jesus, they come back to one another. And I'm sure they had a wonderful service that morning. And there wasn't a thing to hinder the grace of God blessing that couple. Well, that's the way it goes. It's not only your wife, anybody else. And oh, this is the blood sprinkled way. It isn't the way where people don't sometimes slip. But it's a way that provides for failure, if you will call it by its name. It's something sweet, is right down on our level. Although it's a highway. The standards are high. Highest is always the standard. Not that you struggle to attain those standards, but you simply repent when you don't. And you find Jesus there to meet you restore you, forgive you, cleanse you, and to put into your heart that which was, what just wasn't there before. And you find a love that isn't yours and a sweetness that wasn't yours. And you say, well, this is the real Christian life at last. This is the way. This is that old, original, primitive way of the primitive church. The way of the blood. I must needs go home by the blood sprinkled way there's no other way than this. Well, now we move on quickly to think. Where does the way lead? Now, will you turn to John's Gospel again? John, John's Gospel, Gospel chapter 14. Verse 4, the same few verses we read yesterday morning. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith, Show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said, He that has seen me hath seen the Father. Now let me just expound that little scripture first and we will, you will see what is the theme we're going to touch upon. Jesus said, whither I go you know and the way you know. Thomas said, you're wrong Lord, we don't know whither you're going and we don't know the way. Jesus said, you do know the way. How's that Lord? For I am the way. And if you had known me, you would have known the way. No man comes unto the Father. But by me, I am the way. 
Well, then, if we know the way, we certainly don't know the whither. Oh, yes, said Jesus, in effect, you know the whither too. Well, how's that? Well, this way, as I just told you, leads to the Father. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So we haven't seen the Father, says the Lord, that says, said Philip. Yes, you have, said the Lord. For he that has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And so we see that day Jesus not only claimed to be the way, but himself to be the wither. You don't come to Jesus and find him the way to something else or someone else. He is the end. He is the wither. He's both the way and the end. The way and the wither. And so we see here then that Jesus is saying virtually, I am the end. I am the door. I am the way. I am the end. Now the question we want to ask ourselves, is Jesus the end to us? And I'm going to suggest that unless you're very unlike me, very often Jesus is not the end. Something else is the end. Now someone may say, these meetings have been a tremendous help to me. I've seen the way of repentance, the way of bowing my neck, the way of brokenness. It's costly. But I know it's the only way to walk. It's the only way to revival. It's only when we will bend our necks that revival can come. Jesus is the way to revival. This is the only way which I'll ever be used. I can't expect the Spirit of God to use me to the winning of others unless I'm willing to go on the blood-sprinkled way of brokenness and repentance. And therefore, for, for such, the end is to be used. For some, the end is revival. The end is the youth. There's another. We preachers are very much inclined to say, I can't expect God to work in our church and to bring the people unless I myself am willing to be the first to, be, to get right with God. By the way, that's a great advantage for a preacher. Most people think it's a preacher because everybody else got to repent. It's a great thing when the preacher says, I've got to be the first. That's a great advance. We evangelists and preachers, we are very slow. David said, why are you the last? speak a word to bring back the king and we who are in the leadership sometimes want everybody else to break and then pat me we'll be the last but it's a wonderful thing when God shows us as he does that we've got to be the first only so can God work in the church and bless the people the end in such a case is God working in the church bringing the people the thing beginning to lift up and spiritual success to come and a man may say to him, it is hard to bend my neck, but my one, it is going to be worth it. And he has a mental picture of spiritual prosperity, of the people coming, of everything going well. Others of us, they say, it's power that I need, and this is the way to power. This is the way to power. Where all the saints of God went, you can turn to the biographies, there was always an hour in every man's life when if they were got power at all they had to be broken at the foot of the cross. Therefore, for this great gift of power I am prepared. It's necessary to God to deal with me however he likes and power becomes the end. Others of us feel when others is the only way to a peaceful home. I know I've been very much to blame in my home. My husband is very little difficult but that I've been difficult. And I can see very, very clearly that I will be the first to repent. Then uh, I can expect him to repent too. And we shall have a wonderful, happy home. And the tension which has been so unhappy to bear will be resolved. And therefore, a happy home is the end. And very often we do take certain steps of brokenness, cautious though they be, but with an eye on the hope of it, that will provoke the other person to do the same. Very often we'll say sorry, hoping the other person will say sorry. We'll get right with them, in the hope that that will help them to get right, then right, they will get right with us. And that will be just too lovely for words. And so for, we, we're, we're, we're prepared to we're, we're obey the Lord, but there's always an eye on that end. 
Well, now, these ends sound fine. As you've listened to me, you aren't quite sure whether I'm saying they're right or wrong, have you? <laughs> well, I, you see, the, in many ways, they are right. In some ways. But don't you see? They are ends other than Jesus. And I'm using Jesus and the cross and his precious blood as a means to an end other than himself. And that's the reason why we don't get those ends. Make them the end, you never seem to get them. You know, I've known groups of people from churches and, they, and nobody could have humbled themselves more than they did. They were prepared to repent and put things right in the hope of revival. They had all night prayer meetings in the hope of revival and never came. Because revival was the end and not Jesus. And gee, God is not going to give us any end than his own dear son. And very often, a person tries to get right with the Lord in the hope that nobody else will get right with the Lord. And maybe they humble themselves and they eat a humble pie and the other person gets right with their feet on them. Well, isn't that all right? Did you want anything more? Are you worth it any more? If we have our, 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 our white people wipe their feet on us, isn't that what they deserved? They did it to the Lord Jesus. Oh, but you see, I thought something wonderful was going to come. And very often that end isn't achieved. Because that was the end. And even our repenting can be, if you understand the phrase, repenting under law with another end in view and in there where you don't get the end you don't get the power and you don't become used and you do all this and all the other and yet God doesn't bring the crown and you get discouraged but God never does promise to give us those ends The end of the way is the same person as the way. He's the end. And what he wants us to do is this, to let him show us sins, to let him help us bend our necks at the cross, to let him help us be broken. What for? That you might have revival? No. That you might have power? No. That you might be used of God to win souls? No. What for? That you might have me. Oh, Lord, I thought I was going to heaven. So I wasn't the one you really wanted. And deep down, that's how it is. It's power. Or being you. Become a soul winner. Or spiritual success. Or an easing of a situation. And we are repenting and dealing with things for that end whereas what was what God hoped would have been the end was that you might have Jesus you see sin has caused you to slip his hand that peace with himself has been disturbed the vision of his lovely face has been obscured and he did hope that you hope that you would have loved him so much that for no other end than to have be back in fellowship with him again you'd be willing to go to the cross so often it's some other end. And that's one of the reasons of many, many frustrations in our Christian life. We're panting after some other end. We pay a big cost for that end, but that's the end. And so often in the shadows around us there lurk subtle selfish motives. We want power. You want to be sure it's for God's glory. Haven't you got a mental picture of yourself being some great one? You want to be used amongst the other women? Is it only that you might serve them and help them? No, they're not other motives. Being fallen men and women that we are, of course, there are. No, no. The end is Jesus. And I'm to get right with God for no other reason than I've got wrong. No other reason. 
if it doesn't ease the situation, I'm not greatly bothered because that wasn't what I was after. I was after Jesus. I wanted to have Jesus with me, by my side, filling my heart. In the very situation, if it continues till kingdom come, I can bear it if I've got Jesus. But if in that situation I've got wrong with him, I've got resentful against others and the mosquito nets have come, I'm of all men most miserable. And because I want him, that I go to the cross. Not because I want to be used. Oh, the evangelist, I know from my own experience, is in great danger of this. I find that when beaches are coming up, I get very careful. I do a lot of little extra repentance. The slightest little thing that I might say to my wife in the wrong tone of voice, I apologize for. It's all striving. It's all tense. Why more particular then than the other time? And so it doesn't bring me anywhere. But oh, I can walk with Jesus. It's you who I want, Lord. Meetings are no meeting. It's you. When things go wrong, what do you do? And I thank you for your grace. Restores me so quickly to you when I repent. And I tell you this about this end. You always get this end. I can't promise you get those other ends, but I can promise you that the blood of the Lord Jesus is the, end, the way to Jesus the end. Jesus is the river, as well as the simple, easy way to that river. And you need never know frustration. You may find that which you desire every time. And it's the Lord Jesus himself, the lover of your soul, the comforter of your weak heart. Lifting your burdens, being to you what you need in that hour. And even if nobody else repents, even if they might wipe their feet on you, you've got what you hadn't got before, peace with him. Not only your way, but your end. And there comes a sweet restfulness into your heart, a restfulness even in your repenting. I've been in groups where there's a sort of tension about it all. As a certain striving. I've been in that state myself. But how lovely when you're in a restfully repenting group. Oh, God, because they want Jesus and they're enjoying him. And are sharp on anything that hides his precious face from them. And the amazing thing is this. That when he becomes the end, not only do you get that end, but he delights at throwing all sorts of extras with it. You might find yourself being used. Hmm. <laughs> you probably will. But that's not the end. You'll go to another person, not with a, a track, but with a testimony about something the Lord's done for you, and you'll be surprised how it just makes that person so hungry. Say, well, look, I haven't got what you've got. And it's the easiest thing in the world to show him Jesus. Because he's the end, not being you. You might find yourself endowed with power from on high. I'm quite certain you will be the incidental, though. You won't be expect worried about it. It's Jesus you're walking with. But there's grace and glory resting upon you more than you realize. A revival? <laughs> oh, my friend, if that isn't revival in your heart, please tell me what is. And your testimony of joy and peace in him is going to make somebody else very hungry. And they well, I'm coming on the same ground too. How lovely. But if it doesn't work out that way, it's all right on you. So of course you long for their good. But you see, it wasn't this spectacular revival that you read about that was the end. It was Jesus. And you've got Jesus. And with him, God delights to freely give us all things that are in, other in his will for us. And he can give him, give what prosperity he likes. And he opens up. More than you expect. It is wonderful. You see... But the thing is, when anything may subside on the circumference of our world, we're not down. The thing we've been after is Jesus. We're still walking with him. And, it, and I tell you, if there's an in, in, in any church an inner group of people where revival's going on, where they're walking, repenting and rejoicing and finding Jesus precious, revival goes on that church, even if there are variations on the circumference of it. There will be. Don't worry about it. You go on. You go deeper in the center. And he'll take care of the rest and the winds of God will blow again and work again. And then maybe there'll be a drying up. Doesn't matter as long as revival is going on in the center. And revival is Jesus. Not an it. Not a spectacular thing. It's you 
walking with Jesus and finding him all you need wisdom righteousness power holiness you know what power is power is a chunk of something that's given to you power is simply letting Jesus work do you know what wisdom is it's simply letting Jesus guide it's not a chunk of something do you know what holiness is it's letting Jesus live let him be the what I can't be it's Jesus and a couple of people who are finding that and in fellowship with one another on the highway that's too precious for words and all I can say if you want something more than that I do that's precious and I know that God will want to spread to him the next person and the next that life of his son that we're enjoying he's going to have a door all the way but he's the end I need hardly remind you of Solomon who didn't ask for riches or the life of his enemy he asked for that an understanding heart and God said because you're so you, you didn't ask for those other things you wanted that understanding heart the better to serve me with I'm giving you it and I'm going to give you the other things for which you didn't ask extras oh how generous he is when we see, see that Jesus is the end to us all I am. You've got no idea what else he's going to throw in. More than you've ever thought. You're going to be rich and wealthy indeed. And what have you made being rich and wealthy? Spiritually the end. Jesus himself. And you'll know when you need to get right with him when you've missed his presence. The peace of God will be like a referee in your heart. And when that peace is broken, it's like a referee in a game who blows the whistle and the game stops until there's a penalty kick, whatever it is you have over here. And it goes on. And that peace is broken. That whistle blows. And you've got to stop. He'll show you. And because you love him, although it means bowing your neck and a pet of costly acknowledgement of sin, it might mean putting something right with another. Because you want Jesus, you're willing to do it. And you find him. For his blood cleanses you and grace reaches you. Very quickly, there are another sort of end. I like to think of ends such as I've mentioned as ends which are short of him. It is, however, to be possible to be seeking ends beyond him. Now, there are, there are folks, bless their hearts, there's right of them to seek, feel it, that the only way to be filled with the Spirit is to go to Jesus and let him deal with them and cleanse them. But having been cleansed, that blessing they need is still something beyond. I've known people who um, say we can't expect revival unless we're cleansed. They go to the cross, but the revival they need is still something beyond. You can't expect holiness, sanctification is a real living experience unless you're willing for God to bring you to the cross in repentance. But having come to the cross, that's only a preliminary. Now I can go and claim sanctification. So whatever the, the blessing is we feel we need, it, it's in a sense beyond the cross. Now that's another variation of the same thing of seeking any other than Jesus. What we've seen of this way is not the way to a blessing that lies beyond the cross. It's quite common to say you go to the cross and then from the cross on to Pentecost. I don't believe that's true. What you need does not lie beyond the cross. It doesn't be lie beyond Jesus. And that's the reason why sometimes people talk of certain blessings of experience and experiences as it in the Christian life. Mm. Haven't got it. Friend, it isn't you haven't got it. It's you haven't got someone hasn't got you as he ought to have. It's someone. And the precious thing to see is that when I've come to Jesus as a sinner, I've come to all I need. He is in each successive act of repentance and adjustment with himself at that point what I need. He is found again at the cross, my revival. He is there, my holiness. I only know Jesus as my holiness living in me as I am progressively willing to repent of my unholiness. 
and in repenting of my unholiness as it manifests itself, I've not then got him now and again awake for the blessing. Now I'm going to carry. I've got all the hills out of the way. I've been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Now I'm ready for whatever else there is. In Jesus, to whom we come as sinners, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and when we are cleansed in that precious blood, we are complete in him. And he becomes, in each successive act of repentance, what you need. You repent of your resentment. Jesus, in that very act, when he cleanses you, he becomes that love for that other person which you haven't got. You repent of that deceit along a certain line. You judge it. He cleanses you and he becomes your victory on that line. Not having been cleansed, now I've got to go on to something beyond. The Jesus I come to as a sinner is himself. All I need. And I don't need to go any further. Do you know that wonderful verse? Um, Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To everyone that believes. Philip's translation has it this way. Christ is the end of the struggle for righteousness. To everyone that believes. We're struggling to be right with God. If I can do this or do the other, I'll be right with God. If I could really pray more or, or give more, I'll be right with God. Friend, Christ is your righteousness. And he's the end of your struggle for righteousness. When you come as a sinner, come again. Saint that you may be. Christ is made to your righteousness and you can't be any more right with God than what Jesus becomes for you when you repent. But he's the end of the struggle for everything else. The end of the struggle for peace. The end of the struggle for, 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 for rest. The end of the struggle for revival. He is my revival. And in finding him in that simple way that the weakest of us can find him, I found him as what I need. I may have to go deeper in him. I certainly will. I shall never have never come to a place where he may may not have to show me sin. We have to show me deeper underlying things. Well I have to go into deeper brokenness, but I'm not going anywhere else. I found my rest, it's in Jesus. Tell me not of a baptism, tell me not of a second blessing, tell me not of a third blessing, tell me not of a gift of, of healing, tell me not of a gift of, gift of casting out demons, tell me not of any of these things, a unsettled thing. Tell me of Jesus. And I've got them all there. I remember when my wife was so ill and the doctor said she only had a short time to live. My first thing was to go think about a healer who was going around our country preaching and healing. I'd have taken her to the end, end of the country. Then the Lord checked me and said, Why not come to me? Why not come to me? And what was I, the one that healed me? Well, I'll tell you why I didn't go to him was this. I couldn't go to Jesus with an unsubdued will about the matter. I'd have to be broken. My clam and what I wanted in the matter would have to be broken. I could go to a healer and that unsubdued will could be absolutely un untouched. But I did go to Jesus and he did do what was needed. I don't need to major in this, that and the other. I could major in Jesus. And as things arise, I've got Jesus. Isn't he enough? One illustration. Um, some years ago, I went with several friends of a little team to Alsace on the borders between France and Germany. A country which, by the way, has changed hands five times in people's lifetime in the two world wars. Sometimes it belonged to Germany, sometimes it belonged to France. And we have a good friend there had the conference center and uh, uh, one or two from Africa and one or two of us from England went to the team to take the meeting and we spoke by interpretation. It proved to be a very wonderful time and as the sessions went by we, were, we had several days together with several hundred people there we knew that at one particular session God had really begun to melt the people not that we ask for any invitation, but you see it in people's faces. You see that softness coming all over their faces. And we, we knew. And of course they began to tell us. And on we went and on we went. And we didn't call for testimonies until people just would have burst unless we had testimonies. 
And away we went. And oh, how long it lasted. Hours listening uh, to these testimonies. Two meetings of testimonies, I remember rightly. It was very precious. And oh, the stories that people told of his deep dealings with I remember one man had come onto the campus with, 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 a, with a car on which had painted all sorts of texts in great size. He was a great Christian worker, he was. <laughs> well, I didn't think, think very much about it. I thought, well, that's how some people are. But God thought otherwise. And one of the testimonies was that, was that of that man. God showed him a pride in putting that on, not merely to be a witness, but to show something of his own holiness. I tell you, when God deals with people like that, that's deep dealing. And people were set free. And they went home with joy. Remember the joy of those days? There was a sign where they used to give to one another. One brother had gone to another, a leader had gone, one leader had gone to another to get right about something. God had dealt with him in his attitude. And he said, you know, now, brother, I love you ten times more. It was said in French, it was dix fois plus. And that became the great word I remember of that conference. Die fois plus. Amongst the Germans who were there, saying mal mer. And, as, and we used to greet one another with, with ten fingers up. And when we left, everybody was raising their ten thousand fingers. There they were. Die fois plus. Ten times more. Oh, it was a precious time. It was over. And then as some were leaving, a group came up to us. and They said, now we come from the next door town. We've been praying three times a week for revival. We have special prayer meetings for revival three times a week and we've continued for three years. Now our next prayer meeting for revival is tomorrow. And we'd like you to come along. We're going to continue three times a week for so many more years praying for revival. And said, would you come along and speak? They said to us. So we said, yes, we would. It was only just before we went to the meeting we suddenly discovered what it all added up to. Here were a people who prayed three times a week for three years for revival and were going to go on praying for revival. And that African friend, he said, you, they haven't seen it. They haven't seen him. So friends, if that wasn't revival, what was? They might say, oh, but we just saw Jesus. That's all. Well, do you want any more? Could revival be anything more? than seeing Jesus have been melted in love in his feet and repentance and finding him lifting the burdens of the earth couldn't be anything more but you see like so many of us they had a mental picture of what they wanted God to do and thinking of that they were missing Jesus himself and I remember that brother gave a sweet message that day to them so applicable it was from the Holy Spirit he told them how in the days when Jesus was born everybody was in expectation looking for Messiah they had a mental picture of what the Messiah was, how important he would be, what a big thing he would do for them. But he came as a babe, grew up as a carpenter, moved quietly among them, standing among them and not being recognized. And you would hear them sadly talking about the Messiah they were waiting for. What are big things he'd do for them? How they're going to wait and expect and pray? And he was there always. And he said, Jesus is revival, but we're looking for something beyond him. And we're missing the deep significance of Jesus. And the little group are willing to bow their necks around his feet. And I believe that's what's happening in America. Thank God for the stirring and interest of the mental picture of the big thing that needs to be done. And they're not wanting people to work and pray to that end. But they're missing the significance of Jesus himself and the few. Only a few may be at the present for melting and being broken and going deeper around his feet. That's revival. He said that may not look very much to you, but where is he now? That Jesus. And my friend, the few meeting around Jesus may not look very important. Two men in 1928 let God deal with them. They were melted around the feet of the Lord Jesus. That was revival coming to East Africa. An African and a doctor. Equally bankrupt, equally finished and defeated, equally admitting it to one another and equally coming to Jesus who met them and filled their hearts as they came to his cross. Well, it's not revival, isn't it? Twenty years later, from that beginning, slowly, 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 as people just gathered around Jesus, gathered around Jesus, beckoned others, come and see what we see. 
and a spiritual movement. It's not only spread right the way through the whole of East Africa, which is touching the ends of the world. <laughs> you may be missing what God wants you by your pining for some spectacular thing instead of really going to Jesus and getting right with him and dwelling deeper and ever deeper there and helping others to come and gather around that cross where sinners bow their necks and find Jesus to be all they need. And so he's not only the door, the way, but he is the end. How good of God to make it like that. You need to be a Christian who's always seeking for something just round the corner. Jesus is the end and the easily accessible way to that end as you avail yourself of his precious blood draw that separates you from him and, and, and that blood leads you into the very life and fullness of Jesus himself until the next time the devil does something but you know what to do now you needn't be defeated any longer than it takes you to call it by his name and you're free well we share then the simple simple vision of the Lord Jesus himself. Amen.